be talking about right pressing the continue button uh today i'll be talking about spacecraft guidance and control under uncertainty for uh coordinate in coordinated inspection and safe exploration um I'm advised by Dr. Sanjay Singh, as he mentioned, and my thesis committee members. Uh, I wanted to thank them, Joel, Isong, Richard, and uh, Fred. Some of your comments have actually helped me improve uh, my work. Uh, so the picture that you see on the left is the spacecraft simulator lab that uh, Dr. Chang was talking about. So the scenario that you're seeing right now has uh, four spacecraft simulator robots. Uh, if you can see my pointer, this one, I'm gonna call it as a target spacecraft. And there are three observer spacecrafts um, and an asteroid, which is acting as an obstacle. So the first task, coordinated inspection, uh, the three, three uh, observer spacecraft need to inspect this target spacecraft. Um, in doing so, they need to make decisions like what is the best terminal state to get to and um, how do you design a feasible trajectory to get there? And obviously, uh, assuming that we have an experience stabilizing controller to take us there from wherever we are. Um, that's the first part of the talk. And the second part of the talk is safe exploration, which includes motion planning under uncertainty. So when, for example, this particular spacecraft is going from here to a state that can help uh, observe this terminal spacecraft, there could be uncertainty in the knowledge of um, the obstacles, like for example, this one. So how do we incorporate those tasks? Um, into our motion planning and control algorithms. So I have organized this talk into two parts. First one is the information-based guidance and control architecture. As you see on the right, there are three uh, CubeSats that are trying to inspect or sort of observe a target bigger spacecraft. And the architecture basically helps us make arbitral decisions, like which is the best orbit to get to and uh, using an information metric and sort of design trajectories to get there and also stay there. In the second part of the talk, um, first, uh, I'll be talking about GPC-SCP, which is Generalized Polynomial Chaos-Based Sequential Convex Programming, which helps us design trajectories that incorporate uncertainty. And the second part is the safe exploration part, which is what happens if you want to learn the interaction with the environment, if you have a model that's not so good, but you want to collect data um, to improve that model. Uh, this particular motion planning algorithm helps us uh, do that. So this part, we recently published this part in the AWA GNC conference and it got the best student paper award. And this was collaboration with uh, my colleagues from Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, Amir and Changrak. So uh, I want to begin by speaking about a design reference mission for inspection. So uh, just to think, put things into perspective, um, for an inspection mission, consider like you have a target spacecraft that's in a low Earth orbit on the left, and it is deploying a bunch of uh, smaller spacecraft which are going to inspect the target spacecraft and then um, sort of reconfigure around it and uh, collect information. So once you deploy them, you have to initialize them in this uh, stable orbits around uh, the target spacecraft so that you can collect information with minimum uh, fuel expenditure. And these trajectories are called passive relative orbits. I'm going to talk about them later in the slides. And they lend us uh, sort of stable orbits with minimum fuel to be able to inspect this uh, target spacecraft. The question is, how do you choose these orbits? Once you're there, you can uh, inspect the, the target spacecraft using pointing control and um, also sort of looking at areas which are interested to you. Uh, maybe this initial orbits might not be uh, the perfect orbits to inspect the target spacecraft entirely. So you might want to reconfigure to different orbits. So that's the third phase where you're inspecting and reconfiguring. So if uh, uh, we want to design such a mission, typically we are going to think about what are the functional requirements, operational requirements and constraints in terms of cost and scheduling. So thinking about functional requirements, orbits, pointing and um, coverage requirements and also communication architecture, they play a really important role. So we can split the thought process into four main areas uh, coming from autonomy perspective, which is data delivery, communications, architecture, tasking, scheduling and control and uh, mission timeline. So what I'm going to talk about today is basically um, tasking, 
scheduling and control it fits in there. And I want to sort of incorporate information based approach to sort of sense plan act, um, sort of integrate information based planning approach to sense plan and act. Uh, this second part of the talk, which handles uncertainty in planning and control. So basically uh, reinforcing my earlier uh, comment that if there is uncertainty in uh, neighboring spacecraft, how are you going to handle it? So this is how the uh, higher level mission objectives, typically the functional requirements are, which orbits to get to and which areas to point to is integrated with motion planning and control architecture in the, in the architecture that I'm going to present. So in the high level mission objectives, you select the orbits and also the pointing vector and motion planning uh, aspect basically designs a trajectory to get to that orbit or point to that particular area on the target spacecraft. And the control basically inputs forces and torques so that um, you are moving in that particular area of interest. So here's an example of how it looks for the passive relative orbits that I'm talking about. So here there are two orbits on so there are uh, two orbits here. The red orbits are the initial orbits and the blue orbits are the target orbits. So in the guidance stage, you design this particular orbit and uh, you can track those orbits using your control algorithm. Um, giving a parallel in planar robotic situation. So high level objectives for a ground robot might include basically selecting an optimal terminal condition, and designing a trajectory, smooth trajectory to grow from wherever you are to that particular terminal state. And your control algorithm basically enables you to track that trajectory as you go along. So what does this particular architecture uh, enable us? Like particularly my interest is if, if we incorporate autonomy, you should uh, sort of get higher science written and also ensure that your system is adaptable in the sense that if there are any sudden changes to the mission requirements, for example, if there is certain structural failure on the target spacecraft that you want to visit to, and whatever orbits you have designed earlier might not work. And so you have to be able to adapt to that particular situation and design new orbits uh, online and also balance information performance and risk. And hopefully this particular approach might enable these space, autonomous deep space missions in the future. So, So there's a lot of related work in this particular aspect in the space systems arena, particularly focused on estimation and control aspects and also um, designing orbits uh, such that you're always looking at that particular target spacecraft. But those are all offline designs, so there's no way to adapt them once you on the fly um, using any kind of metric or any kind of uh, architecture. In the sec and uh, like this, this kind of problem has also been studied in robotic systems in active perception, like designing motion planning algorithms for active information acquisition. Most of the work has been focused on um, sort of inspecting a Euclidean surface or a 2D surface with 2.5D features. But when we're talking about uh, the spacecraft that we want to do, it's non-Euclidean and you have to reconfigure to be able to completely um, sort of uh, inspect or cover the entire area. Um, so one interesting aspect is the information metric that was proposed in the reference for here. We use the same information metrics. They use it to design control policy so that you can deploy robots. We use it as a cost function in an optimal control problem that I'll be talking about in a second to basically select um, target orbits to get to. So passive relative orbits, I've been talking about this particular orbits in the earlier slides. The idea is that uh, this target chief spacecraft that deployed a deputy spacecraft and to design these orbits that are stable around the chief with respect to this chief uh, frame that is called local vertical local horizontal frame. All you need is to estimate the location of the deputy uh, with respect to the chief and use that to compute the delta V required to match the energy of the deputy with the chief. So if you compute the delta V using that energy matching conditions, you can sort of put them in sort of bounded stable motion with respect to the LVLH frame. So there, these are stable orbits around the chief in the LVLH frame. So how are they, how do they look with respect to Earth? So this is an example of how the orbits look with respect to Earth. So here are six spacecrafts in Deployed, uh, deployed around Earth, and 
um, using the initial conditions I was describing about, and they're pointing towards uh, the Earth uh, in a synchronous fashion. What we need is something like this to point towards the um, uh, LVLH frame or towards the chief. So I also talked about reconfiguration and initialization to be able to adapt to situations. So that reconfiguration and initialization problem has been studied by Dan in Dr. Chang's group uh, using a controlled cost. So given a terminal state and initial state, and also the state of all your neighbors, you can design safe trajectories um, to go from orbit A to orbit B. So here are examples. So once your chief uh, is deployed, you can solve that problem and construct a trajectory to get to this orbit, provided you know where you want to get to in this particular orbit. So basically the terminal state. You can also use it to reconfigure from one passive relatable, uh, relative orbit to the other and also in the multi-agent setting. The idea is that you need to know your initial and terminal states um, on the orbit. So given an orbit, we need to figure out what is the best state to get to as well. So to solve this problem, uh, we propose this particular method to incorporate information-based uh, cost in the control, sorry, in the optimization problem. So this particular cost is very similar to uh, information fusion filter, uh, except that we put weights um, to know what particular area of the target spacecraft you want to visit to. So to make this particular uh, aspects computable, we, uh, we have discretized the target spacecraft into the landmark points and sort of efficiently constructed a octet structure to incorporate the pose of each of the landmark. This work, a uh, particular aspect was done by Alexi in our group, which we have used for this, um, solving this problem. So solving this problem in one particular go that involves dynamics, uh, safe set, and this inspection sensor model uh, is evidently difficult. So we have decomposed the problem into multiple stages. There's an offline stage where you select uh, possible PRO candidates. They are randomly selected. So we basically sample from the space around the target spacecraft. Um, the way we do it is basically project the PRO conditions into cylindrical coordinates and you can sample such that it covers the entire CubeSat. Um, and also store the pose information that I was talking into a recasting database. So it helps us basically check if particular landmarks on the target spacecraft are visible or not. And once you select the candidates, then you plan the reconfiguration strategies by assigning uh, fuel optimally. Uh, like for example, there are three uh, observer spacecraft that you want to assign to multiple um, PROs. We compute a fuel optimal way to do it and do the assignment problem using uh, something like a Hungarian selection method. And that is supplied to a mid-rate um, uh, stage, which basically does attitude planning and uh, and we do attitude control at higher rate. So this is how the architecture look right, looks like. So the orbit sampling is done at random. So you can do it and save it uh, on, on, in memory and basically do the orbit selection as you go using the information cost. So this needs to be computed uh, and it can be computed given the sensor model um, and basically select that has the minimum information uh, cost, which is indirectly proportional to the coverage in this case. And then we do the orbit assignment and reconfiguration uh, planning that I was talking about and do the attitude selection in a greedy fashion, like what is the next best attitude to get to. So once we do this and put all of this together, you can run the simulation and achieve coverage of the target spacecraft. Uh, as you can see, the info, as the information cost reduces, you basically cover the entire spacecraft. And here are the trajectories uh, run on a ROS based simulator. Sorry. Uh, that are generated out of uh, this particular information guidance and control. So this particular architecture uh, also helps us design like uh, what are the number of deputies required to achieve a mission and given time constraints and safety constraints, um, how many deputies do we need to cover a particular area? So there is always a choice of deciding which orbits that we want to do offline and also, sorry. Okay. So 
uh, you can select the arbits and basically assign them and uh, also decide which is the how many deputies you need and also analyze safety versus effectiveness of achieving the coverage. So we went ahead and implemented this on hardware. So this is a spacecraft simulator test that I was talking about earlier. So in this case, uh, there are three deputies that are actively trying to observe the four um, landmark uh, directions that I was talking about. In this case, I just assume that the deputy two and three are stationary uh, and there's only one active deputy, deputy one. And deputy two and three basically communicate a list of information saying that these are the directions that we have visited to the deputy one. And, and the deputy one basically designs a trajectory um, from its initial position to the terminal state. I'll briefly talk about how we select the terminal state in this case. So before saying that the spacecraft dynamical simulators have a architecture like decentralized architecture in them, given the map and states, uh, they run a asymptotically optimal RIT that samples from the control space to generate initial feasible trajectory and uh, optimize it using sequential convex programming. So we have thrusters and reaction wheels on top of it. Currently, uh, for the experiments I'm going to talk about, I'm only using thrusters as the actuators. Um, we have a controller that computes the forces and that is allocated using control allocation part and supply to the spacecraft simulator. So for the inspection part, uh, each spacecraft, given the information of, sorry, given the information of the unobserved state, unobserved directions, we can sample the state space around the target spacecraft very similar to something like RRT and check for the information using the information cost and the sensor model. Here I'm using RGB sensor model, which basically where the variance scales with the distance uh, from the target spacecraft. So, and very similar to doing collision checking in RRT, here I do visibility checking. So sampling the blue, um, terminal states, we can check quickly uh, which are the states that are visible for the two uh, unobserved states. And in those states, we can estimate the cost to go and optimally weigh based on the H cost and the cost to go and select a path. So this is the optimal path uh, for in terms of both information acquisition and the control. And once such a trajectory is generated, you can the spacecraft sort of in, uh, uses the feedback controller it has on top of it and gets to it. Uh, gets to the terminal state to observe. I'm not sure why the video is glitching. But... So once you get to the terminal state, um, you need to re redo the planning stage. So I'm gonna give an example of planning for a single agent that's trying to cover all the four surfaces of a target spacecraft. So the observer spacecraft is starting from here and basically selecting the best terminal state to view or one of the four unobserved surfaces. So once it gets there, it redoes the planning um, by considering both the information cost as well as the control cost till it covers the, all the surfaces, all the point of views as we specified before starting. So in this particular work, what we did was uh, propose an information-driven architecture for autonomy and also multiple stages uh, that are required to implement it uh, on a spacecraft. For example, uh, what orbits to select and how to as assign those orbits to the multiple deputies and how to sort of initialize the spacecraft in those orbits and actively collect information. So, so far I've only talked about centralized architecture. We can decentralize this particular architecture um, using uh, strategies that we have talked about in the paper, which has basically come up with broadcasting uh, techniques of sharing the information database also, um, also storing, uh, also sharing which orbits the neighbor spacecraft uh, is going to take by updating the database regularly. So in the first part so far, uh, I've talked about uh, uh, trajectory design by assuming that I know perfect information about the initial state and the terminal state and also the dynamics. Uh, for example, uh, here are the examples of passive relative orbits if there is uncertainty in initial position and velocity. As you can see, when there are proximity operations, the initial uh, uncertainty in the initial position does not affect it much. But if there is uncertainty in thruster actuation, it affects the, um, there could be possible collisions when there are multiple spacecraft that are trying to move around and actively achieve information. 
So to handle this problem, uh, we uh, formulate a chance constraint stochastic optimal control problem. Very similar to earlier, we have a cost, but right now it's an expectation cost to accommodate for the uncertainty uh, as we model it as an unbounded input to the dynamics. Um, and now the safety constraints are chance constraints. Uh, so we need to satisfy them with certain degree of probability assigned to it. And initial condition is assumed to known perfectly, but this can be relaxed by saying that we only know the mean of the initial condition. And the terminal set could be uh, a probabilistic constraint like what we specified here. So this problem has been studied quite a bit. I'm gonna give a brief insight into how to think about uh, stochastic optimal control problems and how this differs from the earlier optimal control problem that I talked about. So the motion planning from uncertainty, we formulate it as a stochastic nonlinear optimal control problem. So there's an initial state distribution and the terminal state distribution. So the idea is that we want to compute a sequence of distributions that are optimal in terms of the cost we give. Typically, this problem is projected to a deterministic space, uh, either via using a moment space method or generating samples. And uh, the approach we propose is generalized polynomial case to project into a deterministic space. Once we have it in a deterministic space, we can use uh, discretization techniques to basically come up with constrained optimization problems and solve it and project back the solution um, into probabilistic safe motion planning uh, to compute a probabilistic safe motion plan. So, this work has been heavily studied in the last 15, 20 years, um, specifically using linearization methods. So uh, given a uh, nonlinear stochastic differential equation, you construct a linear covariance propagation technique so that you can estimate the mean and variance and use it to sort of compute a uh, Gaussian confidence-based safe set. So that's one approach. Um, and the second approach is basically when there are no constraints, what you can do is come up, use a path integral approach where uh, given your cost function is quadratic and you can assume a particular feedback form on your control and sort of construct a linear PD of the stochastic Hamiltonian Jacobian equation that can be solved uh, analytically. Uh, so using that approach, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of implementations from, uh, from Georgia Tech where they try to apply to uh, learning-based methods and also come up with differential dynamic programming um, under uncertainty. So the approach we propose is basically um, use uh, polynomial cues because linearization might not work when you're trying to propagate uncertainty for uh, highly nonlinear systems. And I'll show that when you use uh, Gaussian confidence bounds, your collision constraints might not satisfy the probability that you're specifying ahead of time. So polynomial chaos approach has been recently studied in the last 10 years, uh, mostly related to chemical plants and also trying to think about how uncertainty is propagating in chemical systems and chemical reactions. Uh, there's been recent studies in trying to uh, apply it in control, but the constraint formulations are a uh, little bit ad hoc and they're only applicable to linear systems. So we extend that to nonlinear systems as well. So in the chance constraints perspective, um, initially there's been some study on using um, handling uncertainty in parameters rather than in state variables. Uh, in our case, the uncertainty in state variables and it makes the constraint non-convex. So projecting it into polynomial chaos space makes it uh, convex. That's one of the contributions that we make in this case. So. Uh, Tide and Birdie actually talked about collision checking uh, with uncertainty in both system dynamics environment. We actually extend this uh, using a distribution robustness framework so that we can apply this to nonlinear systems as well. Um, so the ideas that we use have been borrowed from the linear constraint work done by Califer and the quadratic constraint work done, done by Zimler. And both of them have been focused in uncertainty in the parameter. We extend it to include uncertainty in the state as well. Uh, another idea that we use is distributionally robustness chance constraints that been used in uh, uns programming, uncertainty programming and use it to compute a convex subset of the chance constraint. So, so brief overview, uh, our approach has two parts. In the first part, uh, first step, we basically constructed deterministic surrogate using generalized polynomial case. 
and also a convex subset of the chance constraint using distributional robustness. And we use sequential convex programming approach uh, to solve the deterministic surrogate. I'll talk about the deterministic surrogate approach. I'll skip the sequential convex programming approach and just uh, show the uh, results that are obtained from it. So in the GPC approach, uh, given a random variable, you use uh, basically split it into a deterministic variable and a random polynomial function that's been selected earlier uh, based on the uncertainty that is affecting your system dynamics. So simple Galerkin projection, you can compute the coefficients which are deterministic and sort of project your entire stochastic optimal control problem into a deterministic optimal control problem using this projection. So this particular deterministic coefficients can be used to extract the mean and the variance of the stochastic uh, random variable that I'm talking about. So neat thing to observe is that expectation can be computed using just the first variable and the variance is actually quadratic in the coefficients of this. So we use this to basically compute a convex subset uh, during the projection. Um, and in 1954, Cameron and Martin actually proved that as L tends to infinity, this converges. Um, it's interesting to note that we don't need large L for the non mechanical nonlinear systems that we um, handle. Just using polynomials up to second degree can actually achieve pretty good uh, convergence uh, in terms of computing optimal motion plan. So we also project the stochastic differential equation into a OD using the approach and discretize it um, using euler morrow scheme. So for weakly nonlinear systems, we can discretize it using uh, euler Mariana scheme, but for highly nonlinear systems like orbital dynamics, we need to sort of implement higher order uh, integration schemes so that you take into account the nonlinearities when you're propagating um, using discrete dynamics. So here is a comparison of a damped simple pendulum comparing Monte Carlo simulation with the GPC propagation and the linear, um, linear covariance propagation. So as you can see, the linear covariance propagation, the green color is entirely encompassed by the red dots, which are the Monte Carlo simulations, and the blue, uh, blue uh, confidence bound that you see here is basically the GPC, which encompasses the Monte Carlo. Some cases, the GPC actually over predicts the variance, but the Monte Carlo simulations are always within the bound that the GPC uh, predicts. It is also related to the numerical method that we use to implement the propagation. So in this case, since I'm using just first order method, there, um, the, the, it, the confidence bound it predicts actually depends on the delta T value that I'm using. Um, but this can be fixed by using higher order uh, integration schemes easily. So once I've projected, the interesting thing to think about is if the projected system actually has a solution and if the solution is unique or not. So we can go ahead and compute a Lipschitz constant uh, for this case of the projected system, that's a function of the polynomials, but the Lipschitz constants by themselves are not computable because they are expectations of nor of the uh, of the polynomials that I choose. So still, the, we can show that it is a bounded value, and um, so hence prove that uh, there's a solution that exists and it's unique. So another thing that we want to think about is the controllability of the projected system. Since uh, assuming that the original stochastic system is controllable in sense of probability, like you can take it to origin. Uh, with certain probability. We observe that the projected system might not be fully controllable. For example, here is a nonlinear system that's projected with just first degree uh, Gosser, like the polynomials, first degree Gosser mat polynomials. You see that the control only enters to the first variable and the second, well, the second state is indirectly controllable because uh, X zero enters here, but what this implies is that we need to choose terminal state uh, terminal sets to allow for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of situation where we don't have full controllability uh, of the, all the projected states, but we have controllability of the mean state, which indirectly affects the variance of the system. All right. Uh, also, the cost function can be projected, assuming that the cost is quadratic in state and the control is. Um, uh, and the 
control cost is a uh, norm function. You can project it uh, using this projection method and it turns out that your uh, cost in the projection space is also uh, quadratic. You can prove uh, that easily. And, um, and the control actually takes it forward because we are assuming that the control is a deterministic value. Um, and the last aspect is the chance constraint. So we assume that the chance constraints are either linear or quadratic, and we construct a distributionally robust um, subset of it. So given a chance constraint, XCC, um, that needs to be satisfied with probability epsilon, you can say that uh, infimum of this particular distribution given only the mean and variance is a subset of this. Because any realization of the any realization that satisfies this also satisfies this particular aspect. The good thing about distributional robustness is that you can equivalently compute uh, a set that's a function of only mean and variance. Note that in this particular aspect, the mean and variance um, it's non-convex in terms of this variance function because there's square root of variance, which is concave function. And you can project it to a second order cone using GPC projection. Uh, basically the variables change out to be the capital X, which is the GPC space. Um, so if I can express my collision conditions as a linear constraint, they can be uh, projected as a second order cone constraint um, in the GPC space. Similarly, what we can do is uh, construct a subset of a quadratic uh, chance constraint, which is a linear constraint in the variance um, in, in the variance and project it to GPC, which becomes quadratic, provided that the Q is a um, positive definite function and uh, diagonally positive definite matrix. So once you project it, it becomes a quadratic function. So if Q is not diagonal, it becomes a semi-definite constraint. So that can be handled as well. So what we have done essentially is basically said that there's a chance constraint optimal control problem. You project it and compute a surrogate deterministic optimal control problem. That's a subset uh, of the original problem. What we can show is basically as the number of polynomials L uh, increase, uh, this computes a subset of the chance constraint optimal control problem. So here is the simulation of the spacecraft simulator dynamics with different levels of uncertainty. I'll show the model in a second. Um, the answer for small uncertainty, notice that like the dash line here uh, is a path computed from zero zero to this particular terminal state. This is only the main trajectory and the variance is shown on the right. You can see that as the number of polynomials increase, uh, there's a convergence in the main trajectory as well as the variance from zero zero to the terminal state. So for low variance, just using polynomials with one degree swine, which is similar to uh, sum of Gaussians with a bass term. For large uncertainty, we need to use uh, polynomials up to second degree. That is sufficient to actually um, predict the variance and mean uh, accurately for motion planning purpose. So I've talked about linear and quadratic chance constraints. So if I can sort of reformulate the collision constraints in linear and quadratic chance constraint framework that I was discussing about, then I can use the second order cone formulations uh, to design safe trajectories. So here is an uh, example like theorem that we propose. Um, given a circular obstacle and a robot location here, we can construct a hyperplane that basically says if you stay this side of the hyperplane, and this is a convex safe region, then you're safe. And there's this entire region that you want to avoid. Uh, this particular constraint uh, can be actually formulated as a distance constraint from the state of the robot to the obstacle. In this case, I'm assuming deterministic obstacles. So this, after this hyperplane linearization, you can construct a linear chance constraint out of it, which is where the decision variable is just the state of the robot. Um, and you can use GPC approximation to project it to the second order cone space. We can also show that this is actually a subset of this particular uh, nonlinear collision constraint uh, using indicator function. Similarly, we can use the same approach to actually extend this to stochastic obstacle. So the idea is to uh, handle uncertainty of the obstacle by adding additional distributionally robust ball around the robot state. So in this case, you can see that the decision variables are both state X and the robots um, state. 
uh, in the simulations that I'm going to present, present, I'm going to assume that I know the robot state as well as the variance uh, uncertainty it has in it and incorporate it in designing the second order cone constraint. So putting all of this together, we can construct a motion flying under control, motion flying under uncertainty algorithm. So given a map initial and the terminal state and uh, the discretization parameters, and also the uncertainty in the dynamics here, you can do an offline projection and construct a sequential con convex programming problem and save it on your system. And then use a deterministic planning problem by ignoring the uncertainty to construct an initial trajectory and supply it to the uh, GPC SCP approach I was talking about. So doing that, you, you speed up the motion planning process and basically you're correcting your deterministic motion planning to incorporate the uncertainty. So the simulations I'm going to show after hereafter are basically for the spacecraft simulator dynamics, which has a nonlinear rotation matrix to accommodate for the thruster locations, as well as the rotation of um, itself from the initial uh, inertial frame. And the uncertainty basically comes from uh, the interaction with the floor. So in this case, um, uh, I have actually added the uncertainty into the system when I was implementing, implementing the trajectories to control because um, the uncertainty that just stemming from the floor was not sufficient enough to test on the uh, system. So here are some simulations. So here we compare the distributionally robust uh, chance constraint with the Gaussian chance constraint. So it's obviously adding more robustness, but the Gaussian chance constraint tends to violate the co uh, collision probability that you're setting. So here are the examples. So this example are for 5% of risk. Uh, of collision when you're designing the trajectory. So for deterministic obstacles, the DRLCC, which is the distributionally robust uh, linear constraint I was talking about, has two collisions over 1,000 trials. And the Gaussian has 66, which is around 6 to 7%. For the stochastic obstacles, it is actually worse, where Gaussian has 182, which is 18% of collision uh, collisions uh, over 1,000 trials, uh, whereas the distributionally robustness approach has only five collisions uh, when we are setting the risk as 0.5. So you can also basically uh, tune the terminal state when you're designing the plants like you see here. So basically once you design, you supply the main trajectory to a feedback controller and check if the terminal state you are adding up over 1000 Monte Carlo simulations is inside the trajectory, inside the set that you're designing. Here are three uh, examples. Um, you can see that around here, I designed the terminal state with 5% uh, violation, and uh, there's around 4% violation in this case, or 1,000 uh, Monte Carlo simulations. Here, there are no violations in these two cases. So there's an interesting thing that we can think about here is if we can balance risk versus optimality. So if we take higher risk, you're obviously optimal using this technique. And if you take low risk, uh, you need to sort of add more robustness to your trajectories um, by using the DRLLC and you sp spend more fuel to be, uh, get from point A to point B. So instead of thinking it as Gaussian versus distributionally robustness, we can actually come up with a design space uh, which can help us balance decisions between risk and optimality using this technique. So here are the experimental results. In this experiment, I basically plan first and then supply it to the feedback controller. Um, in the planning stage, uh, I fix the number of nodes in the uh, asymptote in the RRT stage and around 5,000 nodes and generate an initial trajectory that might not be optimal. And then optimize it using a deterministic planning and then uh, including the uncertainty model, you get a more uh, safer trajectory when there is stochastic obstacles. Like in this case, there's stochasticity in SS2, SS4, and SS3. And I use the main trajectory to uh, do the tracking control. So the, we had two failures over 10 trials. Uh, one, I believe, is basically because of the floor where the spacecraft got stuck. And the second one, uh, I think the sample was really large when I was adding uncertainty to the control model to test if the plants are actually safe under uncertainty or not. So 
An interesting extension of the trajectory optimization method is the model predictive control approach. So rather than solving a full trajectory optimization problem from point A to the terminal state, if I have a nominal trajectory, maybe I can solve a smaller horizon optimal control problem, which is faster to solve, uh, to go from point A to point B. So to do that, given a horizon TH, um, we need to choose appropriate uh, terminal state and terminal cost function. So there's very interesting um, parallel work in the deterministic domain where you can choose your terminal uh, cost as a control Leibniz function to design a stabilizing con uh, model predictive controller to track a given nominal trajectory. So in this case, I'm going to assume that my cost is a positive definite matrices like Q and R positive definite matrices. In the earlier case, Q did not have to be a positive definite, it can be a semi-positive definite matrix. So basically solve the smaller problem, apply control U0 and redo the problem after delta T by adjusting the horizon accordingly. So when we want to solve this problem, I, the two important things, one is recursive feasibility, like after every delta T, your problem is feasible and second is constraint satisfaction. So in this particular stochastic problem, both are unsolved problems and there's some uh, work in constructing uh, probabilistically uh, invariant, uh, probabilistic invariant sets to ensure recursive uh, feasibility. But we assume that such sets exist and try to design a terminal cost such that um, we can ensure stability. So what we propose is something like this. The terminal cost is something uh, similar to a Leibniz function or the contraction metric and that satisfies the uh, convergence property that's given here. So if you take the Ito derivative of it, the, the, the variance term is bounded and rest of the terms are basically um, less than or negative. And uh, you can con we can construct an interderivative of it and show that if I choose my gamma such that the coefficient of JSF such that this particular inequality is valid, then we can show that the cost, uh, as we move forward in the horizon, the cost decreases and you can achieve uh, stability using this technique. So here are some simulations using that technique. So, on the left-hand side, you see a comparison of the robust sets cons constructed using distributionally robustness li uh, linear chance constraint. The blue is the Gaussian chance constraint for 5%, and uh, the orange is for distributionally robustness for 5%. And the green, uh, the green bound is basically two sigma using Ga Gaussian confidence bound. You can see that using Gaussian linear chance constraint, there's higher possibility of collision, although higher possibility of collision, although the feasible space is less compared to distributionally robust linear chance constraint. So adding robustness, we are reducing feasibility, feasible space, but increasing the safety. So to be able to implement such thing on a practical system, I think we need to uh, appropriately weigh risk versus optimality uh, so that you figure out the right uh, right risk to take in a, given a certain situation. So on the right, for different values of gamma, the terminal cost, you can see that for higher values of gamma, you're basically using it uh, as a uh, tuning parameter to increase the gain. And for any horizon for higher values of gamma, you can track a given trajectory in bounded sense while avoiding stochastic obstacles. So in this work, just to give a summary, uh, we have proposed a new GPC SCP method that has higher safety compared to uh, more traditional Gaussian uh, confidence-based collision checking. Also, the propagation uh, enables, this particular propagation enables you to compute uh, a convex subset uh, for collision constraints as well as uh, terminal state constraints. And we propose an extension, uh, stochastic model predictive control extension of the uh, trajectory optimization technique. So evidently this technique, implementation of this technique is um, a lot of work and requires a lot of knowledge. So we have implemented a toolbox out of it, which basically takes in a stochastic optimal control problem and outputs uh, uh, a deterministic surrogate for it. So using this toolbox, you can basically set up the cost function, the dynamics and the chance constraints um, 
in in the format that I was talking about and get a uh, surrogate problem that you can use it used to solve uh, basically control and motion planning algorithms. So in the work that I was talking about earlier, we have assumed that I know the model of the uncertainty and uh, and basically using that model to construct safe plans. Uh, in this uh, safe exploration work is an extension where I do not know the interaction with the world, but I want to collect data or design trajectories to collect data so that I can learn the uncertainty model. We have published this work uh, recently in the IEEE RL journal, um, and here's the reference. So the motivation is that the robot dynamical systems have to interact with partially um, known environment. So when I say partially known, I assume that there's a physics-based model and you want to augment that model such that your control performance increases over time. So two examples are a spacecraft trying to visit uh, asteroid and also learn the gravity model as you go there. So for symmetric, mode, uh, symmetric asteroids, it's not a big problem like uh, that are close to SPR, but that are skewed and not so symmetric or bimodal asteroids, this could be a problem when you're trying to do proximity maneuvers. And also interacting with uh, unknown environments, recently there was Mars uh, 2020 flight. And after seeing that flight, uh, uh, the control trajectory, I thought we do not need to augment, but uh, to uh, augment the known model with learning, but uh, after realizing that it takes a lot of work to actually get that control trajectory, we need actually augmenting uh, learned data to the dynamics can make things uh, faster in that case. So when you're collecting data, typically there's an expert that helps you maneuver your robot and uh, try to collect safe data. So he ensures uh, safety during operation and also you're operating in the domain of interest um, when you're collecting data. So if we can do motion planning such that takes into account both um, optimality as well as uh, novelty in data uh, collection, then uh, we can sort of use that to uh, learn situations where there, there's, there's no expert available. So here's an example of recent neural lander work that was done where learning augmentation helped, I'm gonna quickly, Learning augmentation helped land a uh, quadrotor. Sorry, learning augmentation helped quadrotor land smoother while augmenting the sorry while augmenting the ground effect into the dynamics. I'm going to play this. So if you have better models in, uh, then the control performance uh, uh, increases. So that's the idea I want to get to eventually. So how to design, so how do we design the motion plans to ensure safety and learning consistency? So making sure that as you collect data and you learn, uh, your estimate of the model converges over time and you're also improving the control performance. So we propose an architecture where we integrate the learning based method with a learning method that outputs mean and also the variance on the mean and uh, use the the stochastic planning approach that I was talking about to design uh, motion planning problems. And once you have a probabilistic safe trajectory, you can sample that trajectory uh, given a criteria and then apply it to a feedback controller uh, that has both uh, nonlinear control as a safety filter to ensure that if there is something that you have not learned, you're safe. Uh, safe in those situations. So safe exploration also comes under the experiment design uh, domain where you want to pick data such that it's novel enough. So basically picking data which has higher variance uh, ensures that you are collecting new data. And once you incorporate that uh, in your learning strategy, then you're basically uh, adding more information to your learning strategy. So there's a lot of work in this direction, the experimental design to uh, uh, like just to pick a state, particular state. And recently there've been work in India cross group where they did learning based model predictive controller for safe exploration applied to dynamical systems. So they take a more robust approach uh, and we propose a confidence based approach and their approach can construct sets that might not be safe 
are cannot be proved to be safe given uh, the confidence bonds. So in our approach, we can prove safety or at least the probability of safety given uh, the uncertainty in the dynamics. So once we learn the model, uh, the, uh, we assume that the learning method can output both the mean and the variance, and we incorporate it as a stochastic differential equation. So once you have this equation, then we can go ahead and use the planning approach that I was talking about uh, to ensure that we have a safe plan. So when we are doing planning, so this particular differential equation need to satisfy uh, certain uh, regulatory requirements so that when we are applying the sequential convex programming or linearization in the projected space, we get a valid solution. To ensure that what we do is we apply spectral normalization uh, to the network that outputs the mean and variance. And using that, you, you can sort of uh, use the motion planning approach that I was talking about earlier. So another main difference is that along with the control and state cost that I was talking about earlier, we need to incorporate a cost that helps us gather novel data. In this case, we use a variance-based cost very similar to the experiment design. We can use any other information cost uh, similar to Fisher information or anything that is computable. Uh, in this case, uh, we found that this is easier to compute in this setting uh, and also sort of incorporate it in the sequential convex programming. So here we maximize the variance and collect data that essentially has novelty when you're learning the um, augmented dynamics. Uh, here is a safe exploration algorithm we propose. So similar to earlier, you have an offline GPC projection stage, but once the projection is done, you do a initial learning. So you explore a safe set around your initial state and collect some data and use that and information cost and the control cost to compute a safe trajectory and do the rollout stage. So rollout stage is important here. So for the rollout, we need to sample a trajectory. So here are examples of three trajectories. One is the nominal, where we do not consider the augmented learned dynamics. And the row is equal to zero is where we are simply computing a trajectory that is fuel optimal under uncertainty and row is equal to one, is a trajectory that is the most informative trajectory. So given these three trajectories, we want to sample and find a trajectory that can be supplied to the uh, controller. So the way to do it is basically, since we are solving everything in GPC space, you can sample your, um, and the, the, the functions that you're multiplying with to your GPC uh, states is a function of unit normal distribution. So you, you can sample that unit normal distribution and multiply it with the GPC space, uh, state to get a uh, trajectory that is feasible for your dynamics. Yeah, so sure. you have two minutes. Yes, I'm going to finish. So, so important aspect here is like there's a model mismatch between the original system and the learned model, and you're computing a trajectory and then supplying it to control. So, given the learning bounds and assuming that. Um, your nominal system is stabilizable uh, or controllable, you can compute bounds on the trajectory tracking which are just the function of the learning bounds. So what this says is that even though you uh, incorporated the uncertainty, you could be uh, unsafe while you're tracking. So you need a safety filter as you go, in, at least in the initial stages of the learning. So rollout is basically take the trajectory and track it uh, the blue trajectory is the rollout, which has safety filter, and the 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 magenta trajectory is just the feedback controller. Um, so, when we put the put this architecture together, what safe exploration says is that if the planning architecture outputs a bounded and decreasing way planning, then your learning convergence and safety are guaranteed over multiple epochs of learning, uh, without having to involve an expert. Um, just outlining the architecture. Um, we propose a safe exploration to algorithm to learn the dynamical system, uh, augmentation to learn interaction with uh, the partially, uh, partially known environment, and also prove consistency and safety during uh, data collection. Uh, there's a lot of interesting extensions to this work, and particularly I'm interested in uh, machine design for autonomy, like specifically science criteria that uh, models that we can choose to incorporate the information-based autonomy and also co-design of the systems uh, using information-based approach. Uh, 
I've not talked about communication and data handling, but it plays a really important role in the coordinated missions. And the information database that I talked about can be used to basically design the requirements for those situations. So another important extension is fast approximations for stochastic optimal control problem. So I, the GPC approximation, even though it's offline, it can be improved by using sampling, sampling based methods. So augmenting GPC with sampling based methods can improve the speed and the performance uh, overall. So I want to thank before I end my advisor, Dr. Cheng and all my colleagues who have uh, uh, supported me and also worked with me over the last four years. And also my collaborators, uh, Ihang, Anima and uh, Amir at JPL and postdocs who have worked with me and also Kek Institute for helping me keep my spirit up. Yes, and um, that's it. And uh, this is the summary slide basically or talking about all the three stuff that uh, were proposed in my book. Right, thank you so much.